in the vicinity, we were able to quickly get a rope, uh, you know, get a line on it and, and secure it. So it's definitely been a great benefit and is, you know, hopefully um, they wouldn't have been an issue if they weren't there, but I think they have really uh, prevented some serious issues. Um, so so that, was, that was one section. The other section I just want to touch on briefly is, you know, we're very fortunate that um, this is funded by a fee of five cents per barrel for any uh, barrel that's offloaded at a marine terminal. So that's given us the funding to do some of the different projects that uh, Andy and Mike and Julie are gonna talk about. Um, and what can the fund be, it, it specifies what the fund can be spent on. And, and probably the first six are for if there is a, a spill, you know, loans, um, you know, remediation, all things like that. But then these other ones that I just put up here are, you know, training, equipment, uh, oil pollution abatement, um, things like that, that all these projects that um, you'll hear about fall under. Um, so that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about the end. Um, minute, what's it? One minute. One minute. Okay, good. Because I, I only know so little about this topic. So um, <laughs> th I just want to cover one, one topic, and Nuka Research has done a really great job on this. You know, we're thinking, what's the impact of climate change? Where um, is that intersection? And, you know, what happens with extreme weather, flooding? What if you're, you're positioning trailers in a location that floods out? Uh, what's going to happen if, you know, you have these geographic response strategies and the anchorage point is flooded out or you can't get to it? Um, or, you know, Boston has put in, you know, natural protective marshes and restored marshes you know that that's something we have to look to protect um, the the picture on the uh, on the right there is uh, or the only picture obviously uh, that's in Texas you know that was Hurricane Harvey no idea you know they they didn't ever predict that they would get 50 inches of rain and it caused all sorts of problems so kind of figuring that out and so those are the near-term goals of the uh, climate change study um, and the update to our threat assessment, but also looking a little bit further out and um, what, what is decarbonization gonna look like? What kind of fuels will we be seeing coming through the canal and um, along the coast of Massachusetts? So um, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, our next speaker is Julie Hutchison, the face of MOSPRA for everybody. And uh, she's been with the department for, for many years uh, as a responder and then uh, the face of the response. I didn't say how long. <laughs> uh, but uh, Julie, we're looking forward to your talk. All I can say is, <laughs> yeah, put the alarm on. I got it going. <laughs> All I can say is I'm back. Um, yeah, I have the pleasure and the honor to be the program coordinator for the MOSFA program. Uh, it's a program of, we do good stuff. And it's great, after all, that everyone's been speaking about the problems and the reality of the Bouchard B120 um, and really what's come out of it under MOSPRA. Um, navigational aids. This is a lot of fun. Um, we're always thinking that if there, we, well, right now we have a navigational buoy at the west end of Cape Cod Bay. We have a new one at Buzzards Bay. It just went in uh, last summer. And we have a current, now I'm breaking things. I hope I don't break that. We have a current meter here at Mass Maritime, and that has created the, Boston, uh, the Cape Cod Buzzards Bay ports, and we're very excited to have that. Steve and I, I'll t say more about that. Oh, I don't have a picture. Did I have the picture on the other one? Nope. Later. But it falls under Boston, uh, Buzzards Bay, Cape Cod Ports. And Ports is a system that's free to all mariners. It's available to all mariners. And it gives you data on real-time data. It's produced every six minutes. And it's available to anyone. It's free. It is run now through our the, the satellites and the, pro the, the definition and how it's uh, court <laughs> I'm leaving it there. Um, you know, coordinated through the system, um, and it's it's amazing. We have uh, also uh, a part of the Narragansett Bay ports. We had three sensors that Rhode Island DEM let us know that they were in Fall River, 
and New, New, you know, Rhode Island was paying for them, so we have adopted them as part of Narragansett Bay ports. We're looking now at pursuing a Boston ports, which amazes us that there is not a port system in Boston Harbor. This is kind of the location of the three um, assets, Cape Hog Bay, Mass Maritime, and then out uh, further to the east are Burgess Bay buoys. Sorry, this is how I drive. <laughs> 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 I have a new car, I get totaled by a deer. Um, <laughs> As I said, the dates of the assets that came in, 2016, 2018, and then the Buzzards Bay buoy just now in 22, uh, it established the port system. Our partners are NOAA and Nirakus. We have Tom Scheike here today from Nirakus. Um, that's Steve and myself on the vessel that's gonna go out and deploy the Buzzards Bay buoy. It was a good day. I think I thought it was gonna be bigger. Um, it reads uh, wave height and wave direction. And I said it's, uh, this information is available to everyone. Am I going to quit yet already? I missed the, okay, sorry guys. I don't drive well. Um, I'm moving on to equipment. Uh, our equipment is really amazing. We have, we did, uh, Bouchard happened, we did not have the equipment that we have now. We have 70 spill, uh, 70 towns that have spill trailers. We have 100 and, um, 83 spill trailers themselves. One is parked out back. I'd like you to take a, you can go out the store. I'd like you to take an opportunity to look at it while you're here, see the equipment that's in it. Um, each trailer has 1,000 feet of boom in it. That's 83,000 feet of boom that we have staged along our coastline that we did not have when Bouchard B120 happened. Uh, 12 inch, 18 inch uh, boom that has uh, such, an, uh, such an ability to take, for, uh, for protection of our port and uh, you know the entire coastline from Massachusetts. The trailers are staged and given to the towns under an MOU and then they are property of MassDP so we can call on them and move them and stage them wherever we need in the sense of an incident or a spill. Which we, we uh, tested that in a drill with uh, MEMA and uh, tabletop exercise for them to call boom, for them to call for 10 boom trailers from the North Shore to address a spill down in Cape Cod. It was just a, you know, call them up, see if they can move it, how long is it gonna take? And it was very interesting, because that's one of the roles they're supposed to have. If they can't do it, well, are we gonna hire a contractor? One uh, town, the Gloucester, said they could have it to uh, Bonstable in two hours. Uh, I don't know which route they were taking, but that was, <laughs> that was pretty good, so we're gonna call on them. This is just a schematic of all of the assets that we have now. I know it's a lot to see. Uh, we also have uh, boom, 32 inch boom here stationed in a Connex box at Mass Maritime and another Connex box of boom stationed at New, uh, the uh, port of New Bedford. Um, again, the trailer, all the ancillary equipment that you need to deploy the boom, anchoring systems, uh, buoys, all kinds of uh, life jackets, um, everything that's needed to deploy it. This is just a picture I wanted to show of a, a vessel fire that happened in New Bedford Harbor, personal vessel 82 feet that burned up. The picture on the right is a textbook deployment of containment boom. Um, it's, in a it's in a certain you know, perfect configuration uh, on the left is a picture of the actual fire on that bridge. There is the Fairhaven and the New Bedford trailers. All of the boom in both was deployed. It was basically destroyed, and instead of waiting for insurance to take place and get the boom back, we filled, we filled the trailers right back up. Uh, we maintain them, we stock them. Marine Environmental is our contractor to take care of the trailers. There's at least an annual inspection but they have a, they're told if you are missing something, if the vent is leaking, if the tires are flat, if you, you know, a tree fell on it, please call us, let us know, and John and his crew is out there immediately. These have to be ready to roll. If they're not ready to roll, they're useless. So we really, really push that that has to be the case with all the trailers. Uh, another asset is foam field boom. We, uh, we required 11,500 feet of 42 inch 42 inch boom. If 
from the Coast Guard. They were getting rid of it, so we took it. Uh, we set some trucks down in Virginia, loaded it up, and took it out here. It's 11,000 feet. It's in the, in the BSUs, the boxes. Um, if you can see on the top picture to the right, it's enormous. It's very resource intensive. It has not been splashed. We hope to have a drill probably in 2004 to do that. It requires cranes. It requires, you know, transport on trucks. How are you going to get it to the vessel? Who's, who's hauling it? Where is it going? It's a very, it'll be a very, very, convol you know, just complicated exercise. But Marian, huh? One minute. Oh, one minute. Okay, I'm doing all right. I'm going to drop something now. Uh, one more, MOSPA grants. Again, just so positive. Uh, our first round was in 2021, I believe. Uh, hopefully our second round will be initiated this September. We're excited about that. We gave away $2,214,000 $2, uh, uh, in grants. Um, they were, sorry, there we go. There were a lot of drone, drone programs, uh, fluorescent uh, radar cameras for detection of uh, oil at night. Um, the town of Plymouth requested and received a grant for a new waste oil tank, prevention of any future spills. Um, we also had a number of, uh, I said drone programs, which is fantastic with the training, with the certification. And then we had from the new, the new England Wildlife Center in Barnstable, a grant to provide to, for them to develop training and also develop spill response kits for field, for field work. Uh, we hope to build our relationship with New England Wildlife uh, over time so that they can respond uh, to a spill in the area and really you know, create that relationship. Uh, the facility, the, the staff, the ability of what they can do. Dr. Patel is here today um, who you know, works at, works at the, uh, the facility as a veterinarian. And it's really, it's just a fantastic opportunity to really expand our ability. And that's a thank you. Did I, how did I do? <laughs> I made up for lost time. Thank you very much, Julie. I, I want to reiterate uh, the spill trailer is out back. It will be there um, after the session is over as well um, and after the whole morning. It'll be there for a little bit. So please, I encourage you all to go take a look at it. Ray Reimold is our... Uh, one of our experts, certainly Moran, is here as well. And a big thank you to the town of Marion because that's is the trailer that's stored in uh, Marion. So um, our next speaker is uh, Andy Jones. He's with MassDEP, Southeast Regional Office, uh, emergency responder. And he can, uh, as you've heard before, he's uh, in the uh, Fairhaven area. And so he has a lot of information uh, about the area, and he's going to uh, give his presentation now. Thank you, Andy. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to try to breeze through this. But uh, what we have is uh, in New Bedford, a lot of oil spills. For anyone who's been there before, I'm sure the Coast Guard knows, obviously, the contingent from Fairhaven uh, knows as well. But basically, we have continued mystery sheens where we can't put any responsible party on an oil sheen that, at times, the Commonwealth or the federal government may need to expend money to clean up. Uh, this problem persists despite this program and efforts we're undertaking in New Bedford. They're counterproductive to other efforts, such as a Superfund cleanup in New Bedford Harbor. Uh, and part of that is there's some limited incentive for folks to properly manage waste oil. Uh, there's some regulatory gray area between U.S. Coast Guard regs, MassDEP hazardous waste regs, there's issues of costs, and also proper locations for disposal. Um, this is a sign, though it's t tough to read, but it says bilge pump is on when light is on. Do not run dry. Uh, skull and crossbones. These are things I find quite frequently in fishing boats that indicate that uh, these vessels do pump off their waste oil into the harbor and to the marine environment offshore. Um, during COVID, uh, Dan Crafton uh, built a GIS program that uh, we use to map all of our spill locations throughout the Southeast region. Um, what this shows is 184 marine oil spills in our region last two years roughly. 69 of those, so just under 40%, are in New Bedford Harbor alone. 
Uh, this is a graph that shows uh, spills reported to NRC over the years. Um, it, there's some question of accuracy, meaning like there's none in 1998. That's probably not very likely. But it shows that there are continued oil spills uh, through this time, and they continue on. Uh, this year's graph has not been updated uh, quite to the point. There's been some more oil spills than four this year. Um, how we got here. Um, this pro problem has been a problem for a long time. So in the er early 1990s, the city of New Bedford um, had uh, HMM, uh, which is a consulting group, develop a report on what, uh, you know, what, they could, what could be done in the port uh, to make it safer and to manage waste. And they identified that waste oil disposal, improper waste oil disposal, was the largest threat to the marine environment in New Bedford Harbor. Um, not much was done with that report. And as spills continued to progress over the years, there were more and more groups that met and more proposals that came up to deal with this. In 2013, August 2013, two, two days before I got married, we had a massive spill in New Bedford Harbor. The, the commissioner at the time actually mandated that I leave the spill uh, to go get married. I kind of, <laughs> I don't know if that tells you guys about my marriage or what, but I, <laughs> I love oil spills, so I had fun there. Um, so after that oil spill, uh, we met with local stakeholders, uh, public safety officials, uh, government officials, um, obviously Mark Rasmussen's group was there, uh, to develop a longer term plan to, to de deal with these oil spills and how uh, we may be able to leverage MOSPR money and state resources to try to stop or prevent oil spills. So that uh, developed a New Bedford, Clean Bilge New Bedford uh, pilot project. Um, part of that was outreach and education. We hired a former commercial fisherman to be an outreach coordinator paid uh, for by us to go on boats and talk to fishermen, boat owners about proper disposal and management of, of waste oil and oily bilge water aboard vessels. We developed uh, brochures, materials, signage. We got copies of the US Coast Guard uh, brochures about oil and oily water disposal. Um, and then it was mainly myself who went on board these vessels. Um, the pilot project included, we funded Global Remediation Services to come out with us and provide a vac truck with personnel to go aboard and pump off the oily bilge water. Um, another uh, approach was enhanced enforcement. This didn't really take off. Uh, certainly we got a lot of people on the waterfront looking out, again, including Fairhaven, New Bedford Fire, and police. Um, but the federal government actually had several very, very important cases, high money cases in New Bedford Harbor as a result of catching people um, working with us and other folks catching people who um, basically illegally dispose of waste oil into waters in New Bedford Harbor. Uh, this is a photo of just what we would do. We'd pull up a vac truck, um, go into the bilge, do a check of the bilge, uh, identify any problems in the bilge, tell the owners and people who maintain the vessels what they could do to change valves, uh, put spill absorbent pillows in the bilges, and do other things to try to limit uh, spills, uh, essentially best management practices. Um, what came out of that was we pump, we went to 478 different pump outs. Uh, that's 243 unique vessels, which represents a pretty good chunk of the fleet in New Bedford Harbor. There were people who wouldn't have us go on board, who didn't want us to. Um, other times, people just had uh, their waste handled by others. So we pumped out 100, over 145,000 gallons of oily bilge water. Uh, 35 plus thousand gallons of that was pure waste oil. So that was a success. Uh, this oil would have likely ended up in the environment. Um, so we also determined that on average there's 75 gallons of waste oil on each commercial fishing boat. Now keep in mind these were all large commercial fishing vessels, not small lobster boats and whatnot. So during COVID, the program sort of stopped. Uh, we couldn't do this anymore. Uh, some of the things we learned were some vessels decided on hiring uh, their own companies, uh, oil response organizations, to come and pump out their bilges. 
Some people installed oil water separators on their vessels. Um, a lot of them followed up on recommendations from our outreach coordinator, made changes aboard their vessels, and again, contracted with Osros and, and others to deal with this. Um, since then, since the, we stopped doing the pump outs, we've be begun to talk again with legislators, but Bay Coalition, um, fire departments, police departments, and others on how we can expand this and sort of take it to a different level from just doing pump outs to having a more permanent solution in terms of a fixed facility or other means to move this forward and be paid for privately. Um, there are some regulatory issues we're working in right now. Um, these are sort of internal things we've been discussing, but um, there are issues with permitting and siting a federal, uh, a permanent uh, facility for oil waste. Uh, so we're determining whether or not we continue with vacuum trucks or build a facility, potentially using some MOSPRA funds that would be uh, operated and maintained by others, um, and everything in between. So these talks are still going on. Um, kind of just covered this with that, but the, again, continue with the vacuum truck, uh, put a frack tank there, which is just pump into a frack tank, and then a, a vac truck would come and pump all that off, uh, bring it to a waste disposal facility um, or the uh, reclamation facility. Uh, we actually did use MOSPA funding to hire a consultant to develop a uh, conceptual design. So we took the best case scenario, which we thought was a facility that could take aboard, a land-based facility that could take oily water, um, process it, and process the clean water through potentially the New Bedford sewer system. And we determined that it could be done. It, it in theory, can be done uh, with filtration, um, and then the oil would be handled off-site. But um, there are issues with that in terms of uh, permitting and siting of a hazardous waste facility. Okay. And that's it. Did I win? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, our next speaker is Mike Popovich. Uh, he's with Nuka Research, and uh, he's one of the key uh, personnel uh, that really partners with us for all of the uh, prevention work that takes place. Uh, Mike? Uh, not only am uh, I represent Nuka Research and obviously uh, MassDEP, but I'm also a B120 alumnus, uh, having served at then Marine Safety Office Providence as a as a chief petty officer, and help support response to that spill. So today, I just want to I just want to review this MOSPRA, you know, uh, funded program of geographic response strategy development testing and training, a program that we're proud to say has, can, has, has been ongoing and uninterrupted, the pandemic didn't stop us, since 2009. So the, the first part of, of, of this, what we call the three pillars of this program of, it was geographic response strategy development. The other two being uh, you know, acquisition and distribution of the equipment trailers and then the testing and training, uh, GRS testing and first responder training. And, and before I continue, just to clarify uh, terminology, we sh we, you've heard geographic response plan, geographic response strategy. These began as geographic response plans. It's a few years ago we, we switched to the use of the term geographic response strategy. It was on actually a national effort to do that, to differentiate these smaller geographic specific you know plans uh, differentiate them from the larger area contingency plans of which these are a part so now they are geographic response strategies so between 2009 and 2012 uh, nuka research developed 160 grs for all of coastal massachusetts all those colored squares there represent the locations of those GRS divided up between six regions. We divided, as part of the project, divided the coastal region of Massachusetts into six separate regions. Within those 160 GRS, there are 561 testable tactics, testable tactics being diversion, deflection, exclusion, boom, using 
you know, hard boom, for lack of a better term, but these GRS also include passive recovery tactics, free oil recovery tactics, beach berming, things like that. But 561 testable tactics using the actual boom that's inside the trailers and other boom that might be available. So how, they, how these GRPs evolved, because we have, a, we have a new version now. This was the original version of the GRP, a Word document, four-page Word document consisting of the first page being what we call the tactics map, which shows the different locations where boom and other tactics should be placed. Pages two and three consisted of what we call the tactics table, which supports the map and provides information on how to deploy those specific tactics, resources needed, and other things like that, with a final page being uh, some representative photography for the, the areas, so, you know, some, some areas within that mapping area, as well as contact information for local, state, and federal agencies in the event of a spill. Just a few years ago, we undertook a project to completely revamp the now GRS using a new Excel-based uh, format. And you know what this, in the, in the, on the back end, the side that people don't see is it's much more GIS rich in terms of data that's available. Uh, also, we think easier to use. We expanded the size of the map and, and you know, the, the information that was in the original GRPs is still you know, all there. With the, there's a, a, a ta the tactics table, which has really been condensed into one page rather than two. And then oh, the third. There's the third page there, again, with some representative photography, um, you know, showing some of the locations within the mapped area. And then contact information indicates the resources that are intended to be protected within that particular. Uh, mapping area for that specific GRS. And then, and there it is in a much more condensed version. And one thing we're, you know, we're pretty proud of with these is because it's Excel-based, we, you know, Nuka Research actually developed an automation process, which means that, you know, with all the metadata, you can imagine a large spreadsheet filled with all the metadata for these GRS, boom locations and size and types and lengths and things like that. Uh, we can, we can Im instantly update a single GRS or the entire set of GRS by going in and manipulating the metadata and essentially hitting a button and creating all new GRS, whereas in the old Word version, it was much more tedious process to update those. Also, these GRS are available via GIS, uh, both through Mass Mapper, the web-based platform that MassDEP uses, all the, all the GRS information in multiple layers, and it's also available on NOAA's uh, IRMA uh, web-based uh, service. And now talking about, let's talk about the, the, first, the, the GRS testing and first responder training program. We're, you know, again, really proud of this program. I'm gonna give you some numbers here in a moment. We usually do seven to eight annual exercises per year based on the number of regions we have, the number of towns. Within those regions, we have developed a long-term training schedule so we know who we're going to be training um, upwards of 10 years out. Um, multiple towns and agencies participate in each exercise. We usually always include at least two towns, including the, the fire departments and the harbor masters. <clears throat> these, these exercises are consistent with HSEAP, the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, which is just a kind of a formalized way to manage and plan for exercises. And one thing we were also able to accomplish was this training is essentially certified by the Massachusetts Harbor Master Training Council. And, uh, or Harvard, yeah, Harvard Master Training Council and, and meets the uh, initial in-service training requirement that they've set forth for Harbor Masters for oil spill response. So by participating in this training, Harbor Masters do receive that particular uh, certification from the Harbor Master Training Council. 
Typical exercise day, we include classroom training on the basics of GRS and how to use that as a tactical response tool. Uh, also, basic booming tactics, uh, anchoring and towing and things like that. In the classroom, we do trailer familiarization and hands-on training in partnership not only with MassDEP, but also Moran Environmental Recovery. Uh, John DuPont is a huge part of this program, not only in maintaining the trailers for MassDEP, but also assisting in the training. And then we do a field exercise, either a GRS uh, testing and validating a, a specific tactic on a GRS, or we just do first responder training where we do capability task-based exercise or, you know, drills, we call them drills, you know, just so we can reinforce and teach the fundament fundamentals of what it takes to deploy this equipment, towing it, anchoring it, placing it in different configurations, and so forth. One minute. And then we wrap up with a hot wash and complete an after action report for each exercise. And then just some photographs showing classroom and hands-on training that we've done over the years. On water deployment, command and control is usually, you know, we, we have the, the harbor masters and fire departments uh, provide an incident commander. We do, you know, institute ICS principles in the exercises. Use of drone technology has been extremely helpful, uh, both in getting good photographs and also assisting in, you know, using that drone during deployment. Um, and then, of course, testing with oil surrogate when we do an actual GRS test. And again, the numbers, pretty proud of the numbers. 2023 marks 15 years of conducting these exercises. We just completed our 91st exercise last week, and we're actually at about 2,800 first responders trained with 63 of uh, GRS that we've actually tested over the years. Here's our schedule for this year. Again, we completed our first exercise of 2023 last week, three next week, and another one towards the end of the month, and then we've got some scheduled for the fall. And that is all. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, are we good for a couple minutes of questions? Uh, I also want to let folks know it is being recorded, so I may repeat a question that you ask so that it can be captured on the, uh, the recording. So any questions? Well, uh, do, we, do we have, uh, we have one, Liz. So the question is, with the frequency of turnover of local responders, what's the frequency that's planned to go back to ensure that the responders are trained? We, we typically have any, based on the region, the number of towns in the region, we usually get, uh, usually about like three to four years in between training individual towns. And that's just based on the ability to do seven to eight exercises per year. So that's our typical, what we consider a rotation is. We get back to each town every three to four years. And we get a good, you know, there's a good mix of personnel that have, that have, that are still with the department, that have, that have participated in previous exercises, but also a lot of new firefighters and harbor masters that are going through it for the first time. That answer your question? Okay, well, uh, we have another question here. The question is, does DEP consider the relationship with the local EMAs to be as strong as the fire department and harbor masters? Yes. I think we focus more on fire departments and harbor masters because those are the people that would be you know, in the community, the, you know, right there, the first to respond. Kathy, any comment on what you have for working with? Well, I know, uh, I, I believe that most of the towns, uh, each of the towns are delegated their authority for their uh, emergency management. And uh, my understanding is most communities, the fire departments 
and hardware ma managers work very closely with their local emergency management so that they're aware of any events that are going on uh, and training events as well. And, and if I can add, we do get quite a few emergency management, local, you know, town-based emergency management personnel that get are involved in the exercises quite frequently. Uh, another question? So the so the question is how can the DEP or the state get boom without using the boom that's in the trailers? Yeah. Um, I think that I mean we have boom at Mass Drive Time and also you know Cape Edgeford. I think that we would use the trailers that are not in the area of the spill. I mean we're still going to use our trailers. Um, no, that's fine. Um, you know, having so many along the coastline, and as I said, if we had something down here, we can easily, with a phone call, request any town on the North, North Shore to deliver their trailer to us. And this is happening before the Osros are in, before the contract is there. This is in that early phase, two, three, four days of protecting an area that's identified in the GRS as sensitive that should be you know, protected. So the idea is that the 83 trailers can move around to take care of a spill in any any area on the coastline. And you're going to use trailers from the, the North Shore if the spill is here on the South Shore because you don't know what that spill is going to do. So instead of bringing all you know, the Barstow County trailers to one spot on the Cape, you're going to leave some down there in case something moves and pull some up from the North Shore and just basically move those assets around. and. And uh, that's what they, that's what we want to do. And if I could add, Julie, as far as the, the 42 inch foam fill boom that's yeah. currently at Joint Base Cape Cod, I mean that can be mobilized too. That's something we'll be working on in the future. V you know, being an exercise, I mean there's six 42 foot low 